turn to somebody and say, the Lord's doing great things. The Lord's doing great things. Oh, he's doing great things. We're going to finish up Psalm 23. The next week, we're going to start the book of Acts for the rest of this year. The book of Acts. Here we see in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Aren't you glad Jesus Christ is your shepherd? He's the one that we follow. He's the one who does great things. Because of that, I shall not want. What does that mean? He's going to provide for us our every need. He's going to make us lie down in green pastures. He's going to lead me beside the still waters. What is that referring to? That's referring to trusting in the Lord. No matter how bad the world gets, how many of you are glad that you can trust in Jesus to come through for you for every situation? You don't have to worry. You don't have to take pills. You don't have to drink alcohol. He will give you rest. Rest in the Lord tonight. You say, I don't know my, you don't know my situation. I don't need to know. I know the God of heaven who is able to help you and come through for you and minister to you in Jesus' name. He restores my soul. He makes everything new. This is just review. He makes everything new. How many of you are glad that he can make your marriage brand new? How many of you are glad that he can make your life brand new? He can take what is old and take it new and make it new. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What is that referring to? God wants us to live a holy life, a life of righteousness and a life of godliness. He doesn't like, want us to be like the world. You say, why? Because I was already in the world. I know what the world looks like. I know what the world thinks like. I know what the world dresses like. I had 19 years of the world. That's enough for the world. Now I want to be separate from the world and I want to serve the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The world system has nothing to offer but how many of you know Jesus has everything to offer? Can you say amen? So walk on the paths of righteousness. Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Last week we talked about adversity. Even though we're going to go through times of adversity, the Lord's going to help us through it. We don't have to fear when it comes. And how many of you are glad in the darkest times of your life, the Lord is with you and he's got a rod and a staff to club the enemy and help you through every situation that comes your way. Let's finish this psalm today. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup. Oh, I love this. My cup runs over. It's not just full. It is overflowing. Surely goodness and surely mercy. They're going to follow me all the days of my life. And look at this. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? Forever and forever and forever and forever. Anybody going to heaven in this service? Forever and forever and forever. Now, verse 4, we talked about adversity. We're going to go through times of adversity, but all of a sudden, King David, he switches gears. He goes from first gear to fifth gear, and he says, even though we're going to suffer adversity, there's also going to be times of great blessing. When it says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of the Lord, it refers to the blessings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I got great news for everyone today. The Lord wants to bless you, and he wants to bless you abundantly. Some born-again believers just don't understand the blessings of the Lord. Well, I don't really want the blessings of the Lord. I'm content with what I have, and I'm not after riches. Well, I'm not after riches also, but guess what? I still want the blessings of the Lord. How many of you want the blessings of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the peace of the Lord, blessings in your family? So here it, the Lord desires to bless us financially, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. It is his will for us to be blessed. He wants your marriage to be blessed. He wants your kids to be blessed. He wants your business to be blessed. He wants your lives to be blessed. He wants our ministry to be blessed. He wants CCWC to be blessed. He wants all the churches in our areas to be blessed. This includes joy. This includes peace. This is health. This is love. This is finances and his grace. The Lord wants you to be blessed and blessed abundantly. Turn to somebody, look him in the eyes and say, the Lord's going to start blessing you. The Lord's going to start blessing you. Oh, the Lord's going to start blessing you. Prepare a table. Prepare a table. In verse 5, you prepare a table. Do you notice that? The Lord prepares the table. What this is referring to, they used to take a hide of an animal or a piece of material, and they would lay it down on the grass, and all of a sudden they would bring food, and they would bring drink, and there were a lot of blessings that were there in that time. And it was referring to all the blessings of the Lord. It's like all of us maybe going on a picnic, if you can put that into your mind. And as you go to the picnic, your kids are running around. How many of you know at a picnic, there's joy, people might be swimming. There is food. What is it referring to? The Lord meeting all of our needs. That's the type of atmosphere that he is referring to here. So he's referring to all the blessings of the Lord. I know that you know this in your head, but God wants to bless you. He wants to take you out of your hole this morning. He wants to change your mindset. You see what happens in Christianity. We go so far, well, I don't need that million dollars and I don't want to need the Rolls Royce. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the blessings of the kingdom of God coming your way. It's not just finances. 
Jesus? How many of you know the Lord wants you to have a fullness of joy? How many of you know the Lord wants you to have some good health? How many of you know the Lord wants you to have some peace that passes all understanding? Come on, how many of you know the Lord wants you to have a good job? How many of you know the Lord wants you to have all of his benefits? He wants to bless you. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. So he prepares a table for us. He puts out a tablecloth. Again, back during David's time, it was made out of the skin of an animal. And they would come around and they would have a banquet. And this banquet represented the blessings of the Lord. We're going to read a lot of verses here, so turn with me to Deuteronomy 8. I don't apologize for reading them, but this is a great chapter about the blessings of the Lord. Let me share with you a couple things about his blessings this morning. The first thing we need to realize is this. The source of all blessings is Jesus. The source of all blessings is Jesus. But please remember something this morning. Do not focus on the blessings. Focus on the one who gives you the blessings. How many of you know every blessing you have comes from the Lord? James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. What does that mean? It simply means that the Lord doesn't change. He's always blessed. He's going to bless today, and he's going to continue to bless. I don't know about you, but I want the Lord. And when you get the Lord and go after him, how many of you know he begins to bless and bless and bless and bless? Don't get jealous of those who are getting blessed. A lot of Christians get jealous of those getting blessed. Don't be jealous of those that are getting blessed. You know what it means? They're following Jesus. They're going after Jesus. They've made the Lord their shepherd. There's a table that is prepared for them with all the blessings. All you have to do is sit down and enjoy them. Here in Deuteronomy chapter 8, every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe, that you may live and you may also what? Oh, look at that. Boy, the Lord loves, loves math. Look at that. He's into multiplication. And I want you to go in, and I want you to possess the land which the Lord swore to your father. Some of you need to go in and possess the land that God has promised to you. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you, to test you, to see what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but every creed that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your garments did not wear out on you. You did not, your foot did not swell these 40 years. How many of you know that's some clothes and some shoes that will last 40 years? Can you say pray? Praise the Lord. I'd like to find out who made those. Jesus made those. That's what he did. You should know in your heart as a man chastens his son, as the Lord your God chastens you. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. Just waiting for a few amens. How many of you know the Lord has a good land for you to enter into? Some of you have settled in for a mediocre land. Some of you have settled in in the bad lands. But I don't know about you, but Susie and I, we're in a good land, and we're heading into a better land. How many of you want to go into a good land, a land of multiplication, a land of blessings? Oh, yes. Look at this. I'm going to bring you into a good land, a land of water and brooks, fountains and springs that flow out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates. I'm glad it doesn't say lima beans. They're terrible. Look at that. A land of olive oil, a land of honey, a land in which you will eat bread. Well, look at this. Without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten and you are full, then you will bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. God has more for you than what you have. The Lord does not want you to live in the land of mediocrity. He wants you to know he has a good land for you, to prosper you, to get you a job, to bring finances your way, and to bless you. Oh, come on, everybody give the Lord praise today. Beware, uh-oh, verse 11, beware, don't forget, do not forget the Lord your God. Please, when you're blessed, don't forget the Lord your God. Because he's the one who gave you all the blessings. He's the one who gave you the health. He's the one who gave you the food. He's the one who gave you the drink. He's the one who gave you the banquet. He's the one who gave you the finances. He's the one who gave you your children. He's the one who gave you your ministry. He's the one who healed your body. Don't forget. Don't forget. 
Don't forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful homes and dwell in them, and when your herds and your fox multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have are multiplied, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness in which fiery serpents and scorpions and a thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and he might test you to do a good in the end. Then you will say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. But you shall remember the Lord your God. It is he who gives you power to get wealth. It is he who gives you power to get wealth. I got great news for you. The Lord wants to bless you. The Lord wants to take you into a good land. The Lord wants to multiply the blessings to you. How many of you want to receive those blessings and walk in them till you get to heaven? And the Bible says when you do that, give the Lord praise and bless him because it's not because of your power and your might and your ideas. It's because of the blessing of the Lord. Oh, he is good. Oh, he is good. Every blessing comes from the Lord. Pastor, but what about me? You want, to take ble- you want to take credit for the blessings that you have? You want to take credit for all the things that are going on? But Pastor Strayer, I work hard. Oh, 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 yes, you do. But Jesus gives you the energy. Jesus gives you the strength to be able to work hard. All glory and honor and praise belongs to him. Pastor, my ministry is being blessed. People getting saved, people getting healed, people getting touched. Guess what? It's the Lord who gave you the idea. It's the Lord who gave you the anointing. It's the Lord who told you what to do. It has nothing to do with us. We are just pieces of dirt, although good-looking pieces of dirt. How many of you know all glory and all honor and all praise? Oh, that's not enough of you. All glory and all honor and all praise. I I am going to run around the sanctuary, maybe second or third. Come on, all glory and all honor and all praise. Don't forget. Come on, don't forget. It's the Lord who gave you power to get wealth. Didn't this band up here do a great job in the special? None of them would say this, but they're not all that. He's all that. He gave them the talent. He gave them the voice. He gave them the ability. He gave them the music. He gave them what to say. You say, don't I have anything to do with any of this? Not one iota. All glory and honor and praise belongs to Jesus. How many of you know he's the source of all blessings? Turn back with me to Psalm 23, please. Oh, no, oh, no, look at this. I love this. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Look at the end of verse 5. My my cup runs over. Not only is the Lord the source of blessing, but the Lord wants to bless you abundantly. Everybody say abundantly. The Lord wants you to have abundance. Too many people are just stuck on the Lord meeting our needs. Yes, he does want to meet our needs, but he wants to give you more than just your needs. Because when you only have your needs met, it's hard to bless others. And it's hard to help others. All throughout the scriptures, can I just give them to you? James 1, 5. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask from the Lord, and he'll give to you liberally. Not just give you a little wisdom. He will give you liberal wisdom. Can I give you John chapter 10 and verse 10? The thief has come to steal and kill and destroy, but Jesus Christ has come to give you life. Are you ready? And life more abundantly. (laughs) Abundantly. Are you ready for another one? Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly. He's not done yet. Above all that you ask or think. To him be glory and honor and praise. The word exceedingly, abundantly. Oh, I love this. It get the word hyper comes from there in the Greek. How many of you understand a knee can be hurt or it can be hyper extended? You can go fast or you can have hyper speed like on the Incredibles, dash. You can be tense or you can have hypertension. The word hyper means way up and beyond and beyond. Above everything, more and more and more and more and more. The Lord wants to bless you more and more and more and more above, up and beyond and beyond what you could ask or think. I can't believe you're not running around the sanctuary. Oh, the blessings of the Lord. 
my cup runs over. <laughs> Pastor Strayer, I don't really want all these blessings. I have enough. I'm content. Okay, I'll take them. Come on, bring them to me. I'll take them. I'll take fullness of joy. I'll take a bunch of peace. I'll take your extra finances. You say, well, why would you do that? So I can bless others. <laughs> Hello, anybody here? So I can bless others. <laughs> we need to understand something. The Lord blesses you to be a blessing. He doesn't bless you, bless you that you can build bigger and bigger and bigger. And have more and more and more. He blesses you. Yes, you can take care of your family and have enough to retire, whatever you want to do. Pay for your kids' college education, go on a trip. But how many of you know there's a lot of people hurting in Newport Ritchie? There's a lot of missionaries that need to be funded. So, Lord, bless us and bless us and bless us and bless us. And, Lord, by your grace, we will help support missionaries. By your grace, we'll bring more food into helping hands. By your grace, Lord, we'll help build a church over in Columbia. By your grace, God, we will do with what the blessings you give us and help build the kingdom of God. Turn to somebody and say, Lord, bless, let bless that person that they can be a blessing. Bless them, Lord, that they can be a blessing. Bless them, Lord, that they can be a blessing. And guess what? When the Lord knows, when the Lord knows that he can trust us with his blessings, guess what he's going to do? Give you more. <laughs> Have you ever heard somebody say this? If I win the lottery, oh, man. I'm going to give it all to the Lord except $1.25. <laughs> Those people end up going to Hawaii and they don't spend anything for the Lord. You say, how come God's not blessing me? Because he knows you'll keep it all. It's true. He knows you'll keep it all. We can talk and say all this, but man, I wish the Lord would bless me with 10. Really, tell me, I was going down the list. Susie and I was going down the list of all the things because she's more of a giver than me. Man, I would help this person. I'd buy this person a new car. Could be somebody in this service. I'm going to buy, pay off this person's mortgage. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to buy so much food for helping hands. They'll never have to ask for another offering. I'm going to support this missionary. I'm going to pay for this land in Columbia where we're going to build a church. We just kept listing things and listing things and listing things and listing things and listing things. And listing things. I want God to bless you. Come on, does anybody want to be blessed? Why? That you can help others. And then God looks down, hey, I can trust the Strayer family, so guess what? I'm going to give you a little bit more, not just money. I'm going to give you a little bit more health and a little bit more joy, a little bit more peace. I'm going to use you in a greater way, a little bit more anointing. Lastly, the blessings of the Lord are a testimony of the goodness of the Lord. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Isn't that cool? You bless me in the presence of people around me. When the Lord blesses people, it's a testimony of his goodness. Really, please don't get upset and mad at people who are blessed. Don't sit there and compare, well, how come they're getting blessed and I'm not getting blessed at all? I don't have the slightest idea. You have to examine that yourself. Why don't you just lift a hand and say, Lord, thank you for blessing me, but thank you for blessing all of those around me. Thank you for blessing. It's a sign of the goodness of the Lord. If you pull into church next week with a new car, I'm not going to sit there and say, how in the world did you do that on, get that on what you make? I can't. Did you steal it? I'm going to say, you know what? Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm so glad you don't have a car just with three wheels anymore. I'm so glad you got one with four wheels. I'm so glad you don't have to worry about it breaking down every other week. I'm so glad that you have a car that's going to work and going to function and get you places. And guess what? It's a sign of the goodness of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ raining down upon your life. Look what he says here. I'm going to bless you in the presence of my enemies. How many of you know it ticks off your enemies when you get blessed? Oh, it ticks off a lot of people when you get blessed. But look at this. What David was saying this, the reason you're going to get blessed is a testimony. People are going to see the banquet. People are going to see the food. People are going to see the joy. People are going to see the peace. People then are going to be drawn to you. How can you have such joy in this situation? Do you do drugs? Do you drink alcohol? You're always in a good mood at work, and you got a great attitude, and you submit to your boss. 
I just heard that you were able to buy a nice house. Oh, it's just a starter house. Well, that's okay. It's such a nice house. What in the world is going on? I only have one word to say. Jesus. <laughs> Can anybody else say that word? Jesus. And guess what the Bible says what will happen? The Lord will visit them and save them. He will visit them and save them. I pray that all of you get blessed. And I pray that when people come and say, how can you be blessed? And you got promoted in your job. Or I see such a peace and joy and patience. What's going on? I pray that you'll just look them in the eye. It has nothing to do with me. We are Christ followers. We serve the true and living God. And I just want you to know this morning, he has prepared a table before me. And my cup runs over with the goodness and blessings and favor and love of the Lord. Oh, no, I don't like this next one. You anoint my head with oil. How many of you know when you have a banquet or a picnic outside, there's flies? <laughs> Mosquitoes. <laughs> Blood bank. You anoint my head with oil. The oil here was a mixture of olive oil and spices and other fragrances, fragrances all mixed together. You see, along with a picnic or banquet, David was saying, outside comes flies, all kind of flies. Listen to the type of flies they had. They had nose flies, flies crawling up your nose. That's bad for first service, isn't it? <laughs> Deer and black flies, heel flies, gnats, mosquitoes. And the shepherd would pour oil on the sheep to heal the bite of the fly that had taken place or to keep the fly from biting the sheep at all. You say, what is this a picture of? This is a picture of the little things in life that annoy us. They are called petty things. I've been pastoring in a, in a church for 41 years now, and it's not always the big things that cause the problem. It's the little things. But aren't you glad the Lord can anoint our head with oil. And when the Lord anoints our head with oil because we're serving him and doing great things for him, those little petty things don't bother us whatsoever <laughs> because we're focused on the big picture, which is winning souls and doing the big com great commission. Yeah, there's always things wrong in any church, but I don't even notice the petty things in you. I don't notice the petty things in the staff. I don't notice the petty things in the church. You say, why? Because it doesn't mean a ding-dong at all. My mind is focused on what? The mission that God has given us. The vision that God has given us. Are we winning souls? Yes. Are we sending out missionaries? Yes. Are we doing great things through the Lord, for the Lord? Yes. Are we seeing people healed? Yes. Are we seeing people fed? Yes. And if all those things are happening, I don't really care if it's a little bit too cold in the sanctuary. I, I don't care. I, just, I, ha I have great news for all of you. We as pastors do not get together on a Sunday morning. We do not get into the conference room and walk into the conference room and join hands. <laughs> Pastor Tony, yeah. How many people can we make mad this morning to freeze them out? We do everything to make it comfortable all the time. Sometimes it might be a little bit colder. It's not because we're trying to freeze people out. Depends on the weather outside. Depends on how many people are in the service. And at first service, it wouldn't be as cold if there were more people attending first service. So why don't you start to bring people, bring people into first service? Pastor, that annoys me. Pastor, I came in this morning. Somebody's sitting in my seat. I didn't know we had assigned seats. I didn't know that. <laughs> Pastor, i got to park way out to give others a better parking spot. That annoys me a little bit. It's a fly, mosquito. An usher actually asked me to move from my seat, and it's on the aisle. Pastor, the anointing is only on the aisle. And do you realize that when sheep are bitten by these flies, they develop scabs and they start to rub up against each other? 
and other sheep get scabs. What's that referring to? Disunity and division in the body of Christ. We should all be sitting here going, Lord, there's petty things, and we know our pastors are going to do everything possible to make it comfortable. You, we want to come. We, want, we know the pastors want us to come and hear the word of God, and we're not going to go so involved in all the little things that don't make a ding-dong. All I know is this. People are getting saved. People are getting born again. People are being changed. People are being fed. How come everybody's not praising the Lord this morning? Great things are happening. Quit focusing on the petty things in the church and life. Focus on the cause and the great things the Lord is doing and get involved in the church. You say, why? Because as you get involved in the church, the anointing of the Holy Spirit will be upon you. And when the anointing of the Holy Spirit is upon you, just like the sheep with David, there are no little things that bother the sheep at all because when David put the oil on the sheep, the mosquitoes wouldn't even bite them. What is that referring to? Watching the causes that God has, getting involved in what the Lord is doing, focusing on the harvest, and none of that other stuff will bother you in or outside of the church. Come on, everybody give the Lord a praise offering again. Would you just do that? He is good, isn't he? Oh, the anointing. Let's just all lift a hand to the Lord. I, I just need to do that too. Lord, anoint us with your oil. Get us focused on what counts, Lord. Father, to be just a little bit more pointed than normal, Lord, there's people going to hell. That's what counts to save them and rescue them, Lord. That's what counts, Lord, doing your will and following what you want for us, Father. Help us, Lord. And our families, help us, Lord, not to be involved in the petty things between a husband and wife. In our businesses, we look at the petty things, Lord, but help us to focus in on the cause in Jesus' name. I had a wife come in a few uh, months ago. And she was, her husband didn't come with her. She says, Pastor, she went through all these things. She goes, I have a great husband. He's wonderful. He says, she said, something was really, really annoying me. And she, tears were coming down. I said, what's really annoying you? What's going on? There's a true story. She goes, oh, just, my husband chews his food with his mouth open. I said, well, why don't you start to focus in Two things, focus in on all the great things that your husband is doing. And then during a romantic moment, ask him if he'll please keep his mouth closed when he chews his food. And everything will be taken care of. It's those petty things that cause problems in families. Somebody is following us. Who's following us? No, what does it say in verse 6? Who's following us? In the New King James, it says, surely goodness and mercy. The word surely means only. There's only two things that are following us. Look at this. And they're following us all the days of our life. Goodness and and mercy. I got news for you. The word following means to catch up with us. The word following means to be with us. And the word following means to overtake us. <laughs> Only goodness and mercy are following us, within us, catching up with us, and overtaking us. I don't know about you, disease is not following me, with me, or catching up to me. Poverty is not following me, with me, or catching up with me. Depression is not following me, catching up with me, or with me. Alcohol is not following me, with me, or catching up with me. Drugs is not following me, catching up with me, or with me. Demons are not following me, catching up with me, or overcasting me. Jesus and goodness and mercy are following me all the days of my life. All the days of my life, the words goodness, the words mercy represent his grace, his love, his favor, his goodness, his benefits, and the mercy of the Lord. Everybody turn around and look behind you. What's following you? And guess what's happening? Goodness and mercy are catching up with you this morning. Goodness and mercy are getting out in front of you this morning. Guess what's with you? Guess who's for you? The favor of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord, the love of the Lord, the benefits of the Lord, the mercy of the Lord is with you. <laughs> At all times. 
Aren't you glad that God is an unconditional, loving God? On your worst day as a born-again believer, guess what you can do? Look behind you. Look who's back there. Goodness and mercy. Pastor, I haven't really been following the Lord. Guess what's behind you? Guess what's with you? Guess what's catching up with you? Guess what's going in front of you? You see, the Lord doesn't go by your works. He is a God of grace. We don't deserve it when we sin. But God doesn't give us what we deserve. So no matter what you're doing, no matter what your behavior, no matter what you're like, on your best day, on your worst day, turn around behind you. Guess who's back there? You say, Pastor, demons are chasing me. Oh, no, 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 no. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. All the days of your life. Now, we have a hard time comprehending this verse, and some of you might be having a hard time now comprehending this because sometimes we get a little bit religious and a little bit legalistic. We have to operate by grace. Because we operate as born-again believers at times in a conditional manner. And we treat people conditionally instead of what? Instead of unconditionally. If our kids' behavior is good, we'll do what? If it's not always good, guess what? The business level. If you do a good job, you're going to be blessed. If, you, if your performance is a little bit under that, you're getting fired. All throughout our, our society, all throughout our culture, it is conditional. In marriages, a lot of times, it's conditional. Husband, if you do this and this and this and this, then we'll have sex tonight. Hello? Conditional. Did you like that one, Paul? All the security men just woke up. Real... Conditional. For our kids, conditional for our spouses. Guess what? It's conditional in the church. Everything's conditional. All of a sudden, we got taken out of the conditional world, and we get put into the unconditional world, and we cannot fathom that on our worst day, God would still bless us. I'm not used to that. I'm not used to being treated like that. Oh, the love of the Lord. I am so glad we are in a church that no matter how bad you are, yes, we're going to tell you that you're on the wrong road. Yes, we're going to do everything we can for you. But guess what? We're still going to visit you. We're still going to pray for you. We're still going to love you. We're still going to help you. It's not based on your activity and your behavior. It's the unconditional love of Jesus. Aren't you glad that God is for you? How many of you are glad on your worst day God's going to bless you and God's going to bless you abundantly? And we're going to sit there going, I just can't believe that you would do that for me. And God says, it's because of my grace. It's not because of you. It's not because of your behavior. Oh, such love. And why does he do that? Because it perks us up to say, Lord, you are so good, I'm not going to do that stuff anymore. You are so good, Lord, that I'm going to serve you in a way that I've never served you before. <laughs> Woo! Turn to somebody and say, thank you, Lord, for your grace. And here's the last one. And I will. Everybody say, I will. Now, I can't speak for any of you, but I am going to heaven. I will dwell. Look at that. I will dwell. I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word dwell has several meanings. Let me give you a couple. First of all, it means it is an immediate. Dwell means it is an immediate and a permanent place. Heaven is. It's immediate and it's permanent. When you go to heaven, if you're a born-again believer, that's the only way you can make it into heaven, first of all. If you're not born again, you're not going to heaven. You say, you can't judge me. I'm not judging you. That's what the Bible says. We're just saying what the Bible says. If you're born again, you're going to heaven. If you're not born again, you're going to miss heaven. How many of you want to go to heaven? you got to be born again. You say, I'm a good church person. That won't get you into heaven. you got to be born again through the blood of Jesus. But as soon as I die, guess what's going to happen to me? I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord immediately. There's no hanging out. There's no soul sleep. Some of you might not understand all of these. There's no annihilation where your body just ends, your life ends. You go back to the grave. There's no reincarnation. There isn't any of that at all. There isn't any purgatory. 
Mm -mm. You don't go to a place and hang out for a while until you get pure, and then we can pray somebody out of here that they can get into heaven. As soon as you and I die, if we are born again, angels come down and escort us right out of the hospital room, right out of our house. They take us through the atmosphere. We go through the second heaven, and we end up in the presence of the Lord in the third heaven. And the first person we see is Jesus. The first person you see is Jesus. And guess what? You can never lose your position in heaven. It's permanent. There is no chance that once you're there, you can get out. It's the same with hell, too. Once we are in our spot for all eternity, we are there. You can't pray your way out. You can't do anything to get out. No works can get you out. Once you're in heaven, you are there forever. A place of peace, a place of joy, a place of healing. Oh, it's going to be wonderful. I get to see my dad again. Anybody have parents up there? Come on, I, I, I'm not trying to get you to cry, but how many of you got parents and grandparents out there? Anybody have children out, up there? I know it's hard, but guess what? They're in heaven. They're in whole. What a reunion. Come on, a little smile on your faces. Just think of all the people we're going to be with. The first person I want to see after all those people, I want to talk to John the Baptist. He's my favorite Bible character. I want to sit down with Paul a little bit. I want to sit down with Noah a little bit to see how he felt during the flood. We're all going to be together in the marriage supper of the Lamb. The Lord is going to come. Oh, he's a good cook. He's going to cook for all the millions of believers, and we're going to fellowship together. We're going to be one big family. Isn't it awesome? Come on, everybody shout out. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. No more pain. No more heartache. No more disease.